My name is Jonathan Norman from the Major Projects Knowledge Hub, and this evening I'm interviewing Dan Pontefract, who's an author, thinker, blogger, whatever was the was the quote he gave me, um, on the subject of learning uh, and different aspects of learning. And I wanted to kick off, Dan, with this idea that I picked up from you um, when you talked about employees having become so busy that they've given up on learning uh, what were you, what was your thinking behind that <laughs> well first of all jonathan thank you for allowing me this opportunity i always love the chance to chat with uh, my colleagues and friends ultimately in the organizations that i work with in the organizations that i study in the organizations that i get to help change uh, there has been over the past five to seven years uh, a, a ruthless change in the DNA of the employee. And, and that is uh, partially uh, at their expense and partially their fault, but also partially at the expense and fault of the organization's senior leaders. It comes down to this uh, ridiculous line that I just can't stand, I loathe, and I, I run for the hills whenever I hear it. And that is, do more with less. And when do more with less is enacted by, first of all, the senior leaders, what you see is a dizzying state of freneticism inside the organization to meet the deadline before the deadline, to add more onto the plate of the, the team member or the employee, to take away resources, whether it's time, people, budget, what have you, in order to, again, accommodate the organization's quest. And then, then you've got to do more with less mantra on the employee, the individual. And so what I mean by that somewhat cheekily is the employee is now doing more with less by virtue of adding more onto their plate with inanity and mundane things that make no sense. So, for example, why is it that an employee now spends, you know, X hours or minutes a day scrolling through their life? And whether that's, you know, posting a cat photo and looking for 67 likes on Instagram or mindlessly just chewing on content that really serves no purpose, it's just fat calories. And so this do more with less means the employee in this case is, is, is ultimately adding more onto their plate that is actually less rewarding in terms of the benefit to their brain, to their health, to their wellness and so forth. And then you've got the organization's senior leaders who are making them do more with less time, ultimately, for the organization's benefit. So when you marry the two, Jonathan, you have this do more with less crisis, and there is less time for learning. And, and be that as it may, that means we're missing out on some of the richer learning, the skill-based learning, development of soul, the development of character, and so on and so forth, because we're just out of time. And that's, again, a consequence of the organization and the individual. There's culpability in both ends. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I was introduced to you um, through your pervasive learning framework, where, where you look at these, the, the three kind of different elements of learning, informal, formal, and social. And I wondered if you wanted to say a couple of words about those, particularly in the light of what you were saying about employees' kind of addiction to inane social media. How does that fit in or, or how, do, how do you distinguish between good social and bad social? Well, that's an excellent question and it's a hindsight question for me. And the reason it's hindsight question is that book was my first book and that's where the pervasive learning model actually found a home. But the book was written in 2012 and the results of pervasive learning, i.e. the model itself, came because of the five years previous that I was working as the chief learning officer in both business objects, SAP, and TELUS. And so if you can back that up a bit, that, that my journey into a more pervasive type of learning with equal parts formal and formal social really started a decade ago. And, and why do I bring that up? Well, well never did I ever think <laughs> that the model of formal and formal social now 10 years later would be usurped by an almost always on social media type of model. And, and we've kind of missed the plot on what pervasive learning actually is. Pervasive learning is, as you've described uh, rather well, and thank you, Jonathan, this 
permeation of learning in different modalities, but all the time, meaning you don't just go to a class for 40 hours a week. You don't just go to an e-learning course for two hours or what have you, right? There are times for formal learning. There are times for informal learning, like shadowing, rotations, and so forth, right? Uh, coaching, you know, walks and talks, coffee mm -hmm. chats with your boss or whoever. Yes. But then there's times for social learning, which is, again, the kind of the asynchronous at times or synchronous discussion, sharing, uh, enlightenment of knowledge, of competence, of exchange. That yeah. may happen in a discussion forum. That might be a TED Talk that you watch, like, for 10 minutes or whatever, right? Yes. But what's yes. happened, I think, particularly the last five years, is that not only is the model really lost, and not only to my point about time and the fact that we don't have it anymore, it's that social media has usurped social learning, and we think, we've kid ourselves, that, that all of this social stuff is actually learning, when in fact it's just fat calories. Right. We're not actually yes. benefiting from the consumption of the fat calorie. We're getting fatter. And I know I'm using a metaphor here, but that's exactly what's occurring. So again, Jonathan, 10 years ago when I was uh, noodling with the idea of pervasive learning, I thought this is great. And we had some wonderful success both at SAP and at TELUS. And then I write the book. And then, you know, it percolates a little bit for a few years and it gets forgotten a little bit. And now, again, 10 years later, I would write that book differently because of the state of affairs we're at today in our, in our society. Yes, yes. So, so I mean, given, given the, uh, the situation that you've described so, so very aptly, how, how, do we, how do we move to this kind of model of, of open thinking, of good thinking within the organization? Well, we've got another four hours or so left on this chat, right? Because there's a fair <laughs> amount to cover here. <laughs> um, well, first of all, in the book, what I'm really advocating for is the, is the repatriation of our time. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes in the notion where I believe that it's sort of the most crucial component of thinking, of behaving, of dreaming, of making decisions, of learning. And if we, if we disagree or if we fall victim to... Time, uh, time's quench of its thirst, then, then we're just ultimately running around with an inappropriate use of it. Yes. And, and we're not going to get any better. So, so the tagline for the book essentially is dream, decide, do, repeat. Yes. I'm not suggesting by any stretch, Jonathan, that we don't have stuff to do, that we're still not going to take action, that we, whether we stop executing. Like, no, of course, we've got we got to continue doing things, right? But yes. if we repatriate the time and we take a look at our calendars, if we take a look at how we're spending time in meetings, we take a look at whether we're learning or not, what type of rich learning are we doing versus the consumption type of learning? Yes. What are we doing with our time? Yes. You know, I, like, I, I'm a football fan, so sadly I support Man United and we're not doing too well. But when <laughs> I'm at the soccer pitch or the football pitch on the weekends watching one of our three children play, you know, I stare at the sidelines at other parents now and, I mean, aside from the fact that some of them are using their phones to take photos of their kids, like 70% of them are just, again, staring at it and, 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 and whether they're doing email or texting or, again, you know, like looking for 67 likes on their Facebook picture of a cat that plays piano. Yeah. Like, how is that great? It's not. And so time is number one, right? Uh, thinking about what we're doing with our dreaming, how we're making better decisions and so forth. So, so for me, that's kind of step one. And then the, the other thing that, I, I don't know where, where this came, but it just, it just happened. We stopped writing things down. Yeah. And, and whether it's you know, in an app, I don't, I mean, I'm not against mobile phones or technology, but whether you're writing things down on an app or a physical piece of paper, a moleskin, or whatever your notebook pad paper is, people are so stressed and busy and uh, overly burdened that they think they can remember everything now. <laughs> yes. Like, no one's taking down notes. And, and again, consequently, what's occurring is that we're forgetting things. Yes. So not only are we too cramped and busy with our calendars and all this content we're consuming that gives us fat calories, we're not actually writing things down to remember. Our recall is suffering. And, and again, we're like, 
it's like the zombie apocalypse of not knowing things anymore. And I'm, I'm kind of frightened, Jonathan, to be kind of, if we're being honest here, between men. It's uh, not cool. Yeah, I, I, I love that description, Dan. Um, there were a couple of things that occurred to me as you were talking there. You, you talked about time, and, and, and it seems to me that at an organizational level, we need to allow the time and even provide some of the structure and the processes for each of the parts of that cycle that you're describing. So, so the, the dreaming, the, the deciding, the reflecting, and the learning, and, and, and really building those in to, to the work day and to the working week. In the kind of course development world, there is this uh, methodology that's referred to as ADDI. It's A-D-D-I-E. And the ADDI stands for Analysis, Design, Development, Implement, Evaluate. And again, it's ADDI. You can Google it. You can, whatever your search engine is, you go find it there. Okay. So why do I bring this up? Well, because instructional designers are kind of like the Greeks. <laughs> the Greeks in the old Agora, right? They would walk around in the Agora and they'd be just pontificating and pondering and wondering about things with one another. In fact, and indeed, they were analyzing and designing. You know, whether that might be the Socratic method, whether that might be, you know, the, uh, the, their verdict on Hercules, whatever. And, and, and in the instructional design world, they're, they're doing that and have done that for years. They spend the time reflecting first. They analyze. They're like, what does this course look like? What could, we, what could we possibly do? Maybe we should go ask people their opinions. Maybe we should do a template or a, a, like a straw man or the, the bones of the house, right? You know, the framing. That's the design side. And, and then they're like, oh, maybe we should try this, try that. And so they're experimenting, right? They're, they're then developing it, but they're returning back to the reflection, the dreaming, and making decisions before, before they ever execute, which is the implement part of Addy. Yep. And then once they implement, right, so people are taking the courses, right, they're getting feedback, and then they evaluate. Mm -hmm. That's the last E there of Addy. So to me, I'm not necessarily in inventing anything new. I may be reframing things from what the Stoics did and the Greeks did and, and what Socrates did and what Plato did as much as what I'm doing from my learning background and what instructional designers have done for years. And that is, let's pause first. Let's yeah. have the time in which to, to ponder, to whiteboard, to ideate, to brainstorm, just to, you know, say, hey, what's the art of the possible here? Yes. Then, make decisions on what that's going to look like and trial it, test it, design it, right? What have you, right? That's the, that's the decide part of dream decide. But then you've got to implement it. There's, there's show time, right? You've got to actually build the house because people are going to move in. You've got yeah. to actually make the meal because people have ordered it. So you got to serve it on the table. Yes. That's the do. Yes. But never forget that you need time for each of those three sections and you need to give yourself the time and the, uh, the wherewithal to repeat it, to return back and say, you know what, I got to give this another go. Yes. We've missed the plot, Jonathan, on all of that. That, that is where society's heading. You, you talked to your, your second point, you talked about the way that in which people have stopped recording things. They've, they've stopped writing things down. And, and I, I, I tend to agree with that. And, and actually, I think in, in terms of projects and major projects and construction projects, that's really reflected in, in some of the process. So the construction handover process at the end, you know, you've produced whatever it is you've built and you hand it over to the client. And in many projects, there's a tendency to deal with all of the handover process right at the end of the project. And this could have been something that uh -huh. built over a number of years. And they're frantically trying to build their paperwork and, and whatever else that they're handing over after the effect, you know, stuff that's been actually completed months, in some cases, even years before they're trying to actually remember what it was that they did and, 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 and actually create the handover stuff. Um, at the last moment. So I think that that's reflected in, in, in every aspect of, of what we do, this compulsion to, to, to be active, to be doing, and, and this kind of lack of time for recording and reflecting. I wanted to come on to this idea of purpose, and, and I was looking at um, your TED talk on that and, and, and thinking about um, 
a case study I heard recently about the Cumbria Infrastructure Recovery Program. So, so um, a few years ago, we had this thing called Storm Desmond, which struck a, a very rural part of the UK, Cumbria, and basically wiped out the whole of the infrastructure. I mean, it did almost to the equivalent of a kind of typhoon or a hurricane in, in, in US terms. And it was extraordinary how the infrastructure program, what it then did, because everybody, everybody pulled together, the whole supply chain pulled together, they achieved amazing things, they did things that they'd never done before in a really short space of time. And the one outstanding feature of that seemed to be this sense that everybody knew what the single purpose of the recovery program was. So this single sense of purpose. And I guess that's, that's what you're kind of getting at in this idea of, of purpose in, in what people are doing. You know, in our organizations today, what, what I see is, is like sandpaper <laughs> or nails on a chalkboard might be even a, a, a better metaphor. And that is, I truly believe that people go to work wanting to do good, both for themselves, for their family, for the organization which they work for. I don't think anyone wakes up and says, I want to set fire to the planet. I don't think anyone wakes up and says, I, I don't want to leave this planet in a good place for my grandchildren. I don't think anyone wakes up and says, I want to put those people out on the street. So that's the way in which that we're going to operate. I, I, I truly believe that. I think there's a 0.0001% of the planet that thinks that way, that thinks you know, ill toward and is somewhat yes. malevolent. So, so you start with that uh, general thesis. And then you ask yourself, okay, what, what about leaders in organizations, you know, particularly senior leaders? Uh, I, I believe that they have made their way up to be senior leaders, whether they founded the organization or whether they've worked up to be somewhere in that C-suite. And it doesn't matter to me if it's public sector, not-for-profit, or a for-profit, publicly traded company. It doesn't matter. Um, I, again, I'm giving uh, the assumption that they, they want to do good for themselves, their family, and all the aforementioned points I, I alluded to. But here's, here's where the sandpaper occurs. The employee who's not in that senior leadership team is often stuck with, with their kind of purpose in life, and it goes against the job that they hold. And I'll come back to that in a second. So there's, there's angst there. So the senior leaders then have a, have, a, have a duty, and that duty is somewhat obviously, if it's a for-profit company, let's start there, uh, to ensure that there is enough revenues to make profit in order to continue to either keep the, the company floating or indeed to grow. And, and here's where the rub happens on the senior leadership side. That sandpaper ultimately becomes a quest for more power, and or more profit, which then leads to fatter paychecks. And so if they are motivated, typically extrinsically, by the lure of power and profit, then that negates you know, a hope that that organization is going to operate for something bigger than profit and, and ultimately power. Because those senior leaders are then only fixated on that one thing or two, I suppose, the power of their role and then anything they need to do in order to uphold it. And then the, the profits and the increased profits in order to both fatten their wallet and then to go out and seek more girth, whether that's acquiring a company or that's smashing a competitor, whatever. And then they lose sight of why we're here on the planet, right? They lose sight of what perhaps that purpose is. You know, the business of business is to help the world, as Mark Benioff, CEO of Salesforce, says. I like that. The business of business is to help the world. Yes. So when they lose sight of that, okay, then, okay, we've got problem number one. Then let's go back to the employees. The employees are, are needing a job because they have to pay for holiday. They've got to pay for the uh, football kit, right, of their kids, whatever. So, so they're often beholden to the paycheck. And... And they look around and say, gosh, I wish my organization was doing better in the community. I wish they're doing better environmentally. I wish they're doing better for the unfortunate or the homeless. I wish they're doing better, 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 where you fill in the blank. But yeah. they have to have a paycheck 
And unless they're able to kind of dig themselves out of the out, sorry, of the quandary, that is, what is their personal purpose, their why, why am I here on this planet, why well, I want to do bigger things, if they can't dig themselves out of that and find an organization in which that uh, it matches, then they're stuck. And so then you've got mismatch number two, right? So you've got the employee mismatch of their own purpose against what the organization is doing. Then you have the senior leaders mismatch of why they really should be in business, but they're, but they're missing the point. They miss the plot as well. And so what you have are polar opposites. And to your example, a lovely illustrating story, there's countless stories of, of organizations that have gone above and beyond that picture that I paint. And there's just, there's beautiful examples out there. Like there are. The problem is, Jonathan, that whatever percentage you want, I'm talking mid 90%, so 95 ish uh, percent of most situations are not the example you describe. They are not the examples of operating from an organizational perspective with a higher purpose, where they want to delight the, the people they serve, they have an engaged workforce. They make ethical decisions and are, are ethically behaved. They deliver fair practices uh, in how they operate. So pay equity, you know, there aren't any favoritisms, right? So on and so yes. forth. And then the biggest one for me, an organization, is that they serve all stakeholders, not just shareholders, not just profit mongers, not just power mongers. And I think that's where the senior leaders miss the plot. And there's not enough Paul Pullmans of Unilever there's not enough Mark Benioff of Salesforce. There's not enough Larry Fink's of BlackRock. There's just not enough. There's not enough Oprah's, frankly. Yes, yes. There are so many employees yearning for that situation to materialize with their organization. So many. Well, let's 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 finish on a positive note, and I'm hoping I'm hoping you'll be able to help here. You, you described a very dystopian world, a world in which the the employment contract and the social contract are both fundamentally broken in organisations. Have you got an example of how it could change, or or where it's changing? Well, I've 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 got a, a kind of a chipper story that shows how you can think differently and what you might want to do as an organisation. So. This will both, I hope, instill a sense of hope, but also show how even senior leaders can change their thinking with, uh, with the way in which that they treat people. So a couple of years ago in York, actually, the National Railway Museum was seeking a new director. And the National Railway Museum had put out an advert in uh, the Post, and, and people started to apply. And a six-year-old named Sam Poynton applied. And in his letter of application to Mr. Tucker, the chair of the National Railway Museum board, uh, basically says, you know, hello, my name is Sam. I'm six years old. I'm very good on my train track. I can control two train tracks at once. I would like to be director of the National Railway Museum. Please give me a chance. The board, you know, takes the letter and has a decision to make. They're like, hmm, we could just toss this into the bin because this is crazy and crush the purpose and hopes of a six-year-old. But, but reasonably speaking, of course, you know, a six-year-old is not going to be director of the National Railway Museum, right? So you have a, a sort of an ethical choice here, what to do. And, and ultimately, Mr. Tucker and the board decided to make young Sam Poynton, the six-year-old, they made him the director of fun. <laughs> and, and they gave him the title. It was a great, cute little story up there in uh, you know, the north part of England. Yes. So why do I bring this up? Well, because every action we have as a senior leader in an organization comes back to purpose. Why are we here? Who are our stakeholders? And that's everyone. Yes. And yes, I can talk more about stories of the environment and the planet, right? And, and you know, not just being profit mongers and power mongers, but that cute little story demonstrates that in everything that we do, we have a choice. Who yes. do we serve? And in this case, this little boy is tickled pink that he's now the director of fun at the mm -hmm. National Railway Museum. And he gets to tell that story for the rest of his life. I get to tell that story to you and, and my friends in England and the UK. But also now maybe you look differently at the National Railway Museum. It's not-for-profit, you know, a public sector organization that might be considered stiff and upper lip, but, but there's an 
example where we can do good, even in the most trivial-like situations, as in this particular case.